welcome, though I don't know why I'm whispering here in the very deep ocean. So deep, it's so dark. And welcome to a class on bioluminescence and the deep sea. My name is Jen, uh, and joining me in the studio is Dana. She is going to be showcasing all of these lovely images or non-images back behind me. She's waving hello. And then we also have Erin as well, who's going to be taking in any kinds of questions and observations. Now in the deep sea, we do have our text line, and so we're gonna pop that up in just a little bit. But you can always go on ahead and send us any kind of observations that you might have, any kind of questions that you might have. And you can go on ahead and reach us at 562-286-1838. And so that's the number right down here that you can go on ahead and text us to be able to join in on any of this kind of deep sea fun. Now, if it happens to be later than Friday the 26th, at 10 a.m. You can always go on ahead and email us any kind of questions that you might have down below and we'll get a chance to be able to answer them for you um, when we get a moment to do so. Now here we are in the very deep sea environment. Um, what kind of things come to mind when you think about deep sea? I personally got inspired by a lovely little black right behind me, but what comes to your mind? Hmm. I don't know if Dana can kind of provide us with any kind of inspiration that she might think about when she thinks about deep sea. Hmm, ooh, so beautiful. I'll go on ahead and I will step out of the way. So interesting. If you're thinking about funky looking critters, this worm might be one of them, right? But as we gain inspiration from these worms, and personally, I am a big fan of worms as I did some deep sea research and the main focus was on worms and bacteria. Anything else kind of comes to mind for you? Does any kind of colors or even the kind of shapes kind of come to mind? I mean, this worm, right? It's definitely unlike any other worm that you might think of on land, right? If you think of like an earthworm, for instance, it's kind of brownish, pinkish, and it's kind of like wiggly as it just kind of moves along, right? But if we look at this worm, it's really beautiful in its color, right? We can see it's blue in color. So maybe some of the animals that you think of living in the deep could be blue, right? Um, it almost is kind of transparent in a way too, right? We can kind of see through this animal right here too, right? And also it has really unique shapes and other appendages that are associated with this animal, right? Like who would think that a worm would have kind of this lobe right here, right? So maybe different ways to be able to, to move, right? So these animals have some really kind of unique adaptations to live in these environments, hmm. Right, so we know that maybe, you know, for, for Dana, for instance, maybe these weird animals might be what kind of comes to mind in the deep sea. For me, it's definitely deep, right? dark even, cold maybe, what else? Hmm. Ooh, maybe Dana's thinking about some of these, well, what we like to call kind of like the benthos, right? The benthic environment, meaning the bottom of our ocean right here. So this would be an example of the sea floor. And maybe that might be something that you're thinking about. Maybe the sea floor in your mind is muddy and flat. Maybe your sea floor is bumpy and rocky, kind of like what we see here, right? Maybe your sea floor has a lot of animals in it, or maybe your sea floor is completely empty and devoid of life, right? What's really cool about the deep sea environment are that it's such a, it's a slower pace kind of day, hence, you know, us starting a little late. Our apologies for that, by the way. But it's a completely unique environment where there is no sunlight. And so many of these animals that live down there have to have unique adaptations to live down here. Hmm. Well, with no sunlight, what do you think some of their struggles might be? What do you think might make it really hard to do when it's completely dark 24 seven? Hmm. Well, for me, seeing would be really tricky, right? So I wouldn't be able to see. I'd be moving around, right? All completely dark, trying to maybe gauge my environment around me, right? Hello! It'd be dark everywhere I look. So maybe, what do you think might be some good adaptations for living in an area that's completely dark all around? I know for me, maybe my eyes were bigger, right? If I had like really big eyes, 
then maybe that might allow my eyes to dilate bigger to be able to absorb any kind of potential light that might be down in this deep kind of environment, right? Hmm. Maybe having eyes that are better suited to be in the super dark environment, right? Uh, maybe having really small eyes that are able to just capture what they need in order to see. Hmm. Maybe having eyes that sit up top of my head and that can rotate around, right? Might be a really cool adaptation too. So that way they could really see anywhere around, right? Or maybe you might be like this little shrimpy here with a cute little eye that has more of a compound eye where it's able to see kind of like a kaleidoscope where it's lots of little images and being able to capture anything around and really kind of showcasing it in so many different angles all within one eye, right? So there's lots of just adaptations when thinking about eyes. But what color do you notice the shrimp being? Well, thinking red, Absolutely, right? So this is a shrimp that is red. Now, we saw that worm earlier, and even in the dark, it was transparent, right? So it's really hard to be able to see the animal. But why is this bright red? I mean, look at the color difference. Black, red, right? It really stands out to us, and we have light that's on there, right? But believe it or not, the deeper that you go down in the ocean, the colors slowly fade away. And red, that's definitely one of the very first colors to be able to go away completely. And so it's really helpful for animals in the deep to either be red, maybe completely see-through, right? Might be another way. Or even purple. Mm -hmm. Lots of purple animals out there too. Like kind of like that beautiful lavendery purple, right? So they come in really fun colors that we might not always get a chance to see on land. Hmm, I'll let Dana pick another animal for us to kind of look at some of their colors. And the animal in the ah. So we just got a question about what is the largest animal in the deep sea? And that is tricky because we're thinking about all different animals. And this one looks absolutely huge right now. And it's nice and purple too. Um, but with these animals, it's really tricky because they either look really big because pictures are taken up really close up. So it makes them look really huge, like this bobtail squid, which is actually quite tiny. Um, but the largest animal, and we were kind of thinking about this because we're like, oh, maybe it's a sperm whale. Maybe it's a giant squid. But believe it or not, it's one of my all-time favorite animals. It's called a siphonophore. Now, these siphonophores also have a lot of different colors and adaptations. And I'm not sure, Dana, if we have a picture of one. Um, but a siphonophore is actually related to a jelly, and with a siphonophore, it has lots of different parts working together to basically kind of help create the animal to, to be able to work together. So there are certain parts that are used for feeding, there are certain parts that are used for purely focus on locomotion, and there are certain parts of that animal that are also used mainly for reproduction or for locomotion, right? So it's like this colony of animals that work together, and they're like all they almost look like they're on a string and they're very beautiful. And these siphonophores um, can be up to 150 feet long. Isn't that incredible? I mean, that's like really, really, really long. So these siphonophores are incredible animals. Ah, here's, I actually have a poster of this at home in my childhood room. True story. Yep, absolute ocean nerd right here. Everyone in the studio is laughing at me, but you know what? I'm proud <laughs> because it is awesome. Look at this thing. Isn't it cool? So as you go ahead and notice this animal, right, has some of those similar features to what we saw earlier. We went ahead and see that, well, one, there's that kind of bright color again, right? Not visible at all unless you shine that light on it. So that's an easy way to camouflage, right? And then we have again all of that kind of see-throughness, right? And so it's a really cool way for this animal to be able to, well, basically go on surviving undetected. Now, if you go ahead and you look at this animal, I mean, it's weird, right? Like, where does it begin? Where does it end? It's just very odd. And as we mentioned, right, there's different parts that are main mainly used for different purposes, right? And some of the feeding purposes are going to be up here. So what do you think it might eat? Just basically look like there's kind of like holes in it. Hmm. Well, usually when I think or I see an animal that's kind of looks, well, 
It's kind of squishy. That's kind of transparent. That has holes in it. I actually think that it eats some kind of plankton, right? That's a filter feeder of some kind. Now here in the really deep sea, you're not going to get a lot of primary productivity, meaning, you know, you're not going to get a lot of algae and a lot of kind of like those primary plant-like animals or plants, I should say, uh, to be able to synthesize via the sun, right? That's just not going to happen when it's just constantly black. But any kind of uh, plant plankton that starts to decompose and die, guess what? They start falling down. Any kind of animal that's eating, you know, a predator eating another food, and there's some crumbs that spill out, well, that starts to kind of come down. Any kind of animal that poops, that all starts to come down, and all that glorious stuff of like, you know, uh, crumb bits of animals or poop or any kind of animals are dying and slowly coming down, that is called marine snow. And that is what some of these animals can eat. They can eat that beautiful snow, right? Ah, a shower of poop, if you will, right? But all of those little pieces together really allow our siphonophore and other animals to survive by eating some of that, some of those, a lot of those important nutrients, right? That's how a lot of it gets recycled in the deep sea, because we always have to kind of come full circle. Now, we did get a question of, is there life deeper than we have been discovering? Oh my goodness, there is something that's being newly discovered all the time, right? So we, one of the most well-studied areas off of California is actually Monterey Bay, right? They have it, their aquarium has their entire research institute that's dedicated to studying the deep sea. Now, what's really interesting is that their area is quite deep. They have a really nice deep chasm over there. And they're actually, even though it's very well, like, you know, very well explored, they're still finding new animals and they're still finding like really cool adaptations of these animals. So there's still much more, even the place that's as frequent as Monterey Bay's deep sea region. I mean, there's still so much more to explore and discover. So I would imagine that there is life that is very deep that still needs to be discovered. And what's really kind of crazy is we've only explored maybe like 10% of our entire deep sea ocean, and there's still much more to check out. We actually know a lot more about the moon or Mars than we do about our deep sea ocean. So if you're interested in studying the deep sea, there might be some really cool stuff for you to still be able to explore. Now, something that is really interesting though, is that there have been new discoveries of even whales just off of off of um, different continents as of late. Now these whales aren't always deep sea, but still we're finding areas that we, you know, travel along boats, that scientists do a lot of research, kind of topside on the water, right? And they still were able to discover this new kind of whale. So it's really, or these new kinds or new species of whales. So it's really interesting that the, war the ocean is really huge and we still have so much more to learn. So thank you so very much for asking these questions. They're wonderful and I love them. So keep them coming, friends. All right, as we go on ahead and get a chance to look at um, some different kinds of animals, right? We've talked a little bit about some of their adaptations of living in that deep, dark, cold kind of environment, right? We talked a little bit about colors. We had a chance to talk a little bit about, um, as well, some of the, the well, the eye adaptations, right? How are they actually able to see that light? And so it's really interesting, um, you know, some of these different adaptations that they might have. So if we think about some other adaptations, well, pressure kind of comes to mind, right? So these animals are under lots and lots of pressure deep, deep down in the ocean. And that kind of forms, that kind of makes them form into some really interesting shapes, kind of like that worm that we saw earlier, right? So these animals, uh, they come in lots of different kinds of shapes and sizes, and a lot of it different ways to be able to, to deal with all of these different struggles that kind of comes to mind. Now, I was just talking about the abiotic struggles, right? All of those non-living struggles. So temperature, you know, light, um, all of pressure, all those different things. But if you think about what an animal needs to survive, right, uh, and what we might need to survive, some things, well, what kind of struggles do you think these animals that live in the deep sea face? What do you think some of those struggles might be? Hmm. Take a minute, just kind of think about maybe some of the some of your daily needs and how you're able to address them, like maybe needing a snack or two. And then also, what about these animals? How do you think, 
I don't, what do you think some of those struggles might be? right? Food is definitely something that these animals can struggle with. Now, our siphonophore is lucky, right? It's more of what we like to call a passive feeder, where it's just able to constantly siphon through the water to be able to get some tasty, delicious meals, right? But there are other animals that maybe struggle with trying to find food. What do you think might be another struggle? Hmm. If you're thinking finding a mate, yeah, right? If you want to keep your species of worm happy and healthy, right? How do you go about doing that? How do you find someone else? It's not like they can put like a little ad up on their local town bulletin board to be like, mate wanted, right? Well, they don't have access to a computer. So how exactly do they go about getting a mate? Hmm. If you're thinking about predators as another struggle, we as humans don't necessarily have to worry about that. But some of these animals do, right, on that other end. So how exactly would they then be able to, well, protect themselves, right? So these might be some of the basic needs that some of these animals have. And how do you think they have these, how do you think they deal with some of these struggles? What do you think some of those adaptations might be? I'll let Dana pick an animal of her choice and maybe we can kind of gain inspiration about that. Aha! Here's our lovely shrimp again, right? Do you notice what it's doing right here? Now that's not actually light that's being shown on the shrimp and the water. It's actually the shrimp spewing out this blue stuff. Hmm. Now our class is called the deep sea and bioluminescence, right? And so bioluminescence is a great way to do and figure out the way to survive, right? It's a great way to be able to maybe evade predators. So like in this case, our shrimp is trying to get away from a predator item. And so maybe it's trying to distract it or maybe it's trying to blind it. Ah, so right, right? Just like if you're waking up and you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you turn on that light, right? Ah, it might be really bright. Kind of the same thing for this animal right here, right? So it's able to spew out that bioluminescence and it's able to shrimp away the best that it can in order to, to survive and live another day. So that's one way in which this light can be, can be used. Now, if you're wondering, wait a minute, that light came from the shrimp. How exactly does that work? Well, believe it or not, there are a few different ways in which these animals can create light. Now, bioluminescence means bio living luminesce to light up, right? And so you may either have bacteria that may be within you that you're able to kind of cultivate and, and showcase, or maybe you have chemicals called luciferin and luciferase. And when they are combined, you get this beautiful light, right? And so you can kind of imagine it, you create it to like a glow stick, right? Like you have, it's not glowing right away, but when you crack it and then you're able to mix the chemicals together, it starts to glow, right? So kind of the same process here, just with those two chemicals, luciferin and luciferase, you're able to get this light. So it's really cool. For this picture in particular, on the left, we happen to have um, an animal that is looking normal. And then uh, with light, basic light is shined directly on it. And then we have the bioluminescence. So with our light off and it is shining that bright blue. Now we did get some questions. Can bioluminescent animals share their bioluminescence with other animals? That is a really good question. Um, now it depends sometimes on the different types of bioluminescence. For Lucifer and Luciferase, it's actually found within the animal itself. So they can't necessarily give that to them. But there is another animal, and Dana, if you could put up a picture of a bobtail squid, that one uses bacteria. It actually uses a type of bacteria called Vibrio. And um, when it's able to use that Vibrio right there, uh, that Vibrio is actually naturally occurring in the water. And so what this bobtail squid does is it's able to grab a hold of that Vibrio from the water, stick it inside itself. And the way that this symbiotic relationship works is that 
This um, squid houses the Vibrio, but it also provides it with sugars and amino acids, so that way the Vibrio is happy. And in return, the, the bacteria go on ahead and help our animal glow. Now, what's really cool is the way that this animal uses bioluminescence, which is actually more for camouflaging. Now, this bobtail squid has been studied in a variety of ways, and part of it's looking at its circadian rhythm. Have you heard of circadian rhythm before? If you're thinking it has to do something asleep, absolutely, right? And so circadian rhythm is basically when we tend to be awake and then when we tend to fall asleep, right? So we might have um, folks that are, not, you know, folks or, or my cats, for instance, that are more nocturnal, right? And then there's animals that are more diurnal, meaning that they're awake more so during the day, right? Um, and so there are different kinds of animals and they tend to be asleep and awake at different times. This bobtail squid is actually awake at night. And so scientists are able to get a chance to study this animal. And when it becomes really dark, because they live a little bit higher up um, in the deep sea, they're actually able to go on ahead and um, the bacteria cue them to when it is completely night. So they have their own little internal clock. And when it is night, they light up and the squid lights up. It unburies itself from the sand and as it elevates up, the bacteria actually have it glow all underneath. So it's really cool. It's kind of like it's camouflaged in a way that works the same as counter shading for other animals that live up towards the surface, right? Where you might be black on top and light underneath. So that way, if you're an animal that's looking straight down onto it, you can't see it. And if you're an animal looking straight up, well, it blends in with the lightness that's being shined down from up above. And these bobtail squid are able to utilize that same kind of camouflage with the bacteria that's right underneath them. So what's really cool about this is that scientists are like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. It's almost like an invisibility cloak. And so scientists, especially some of the military, are using, are wanting to use this same kind of inspiration and technology to be able to almost cast invisible cloaks on their, like, on their planes. Wouldn't that be cool? Just by using that counter shading technique. So that's really an interesting thing about these bobtail squid. Now, when they get too many bacteria, because they do multiply inside of them, they will spit some of them out, plat, kind of then regenerating um, the bacteria that are located in the surrounding waters. And the other bobtail squid can also then grab some more of that Vibrio, stick it inside of themselves. So that's in a way kind of sharing this bacteria. It's a great question. We also got a question of what are some predators in the deep sea? Well, depends on your definition of predator, right? Bobtail squid could be an example very much of a predator. Um, and, you know, along those same lines, we also got a question of do all animals eat the same food? So let's investigate that predator a little bit more. Now, we looked at that siphonophore earlier, and that is, you know, it's eating a lot of the marine snow that's being rained down upon it. Um, some animals will actively hunt other animals. If you had to think of a quintessential ocean predator, well, for me, I think about anglerfish, right? It uses that bioluminescence that we were just talking about as, well, as the name suggests, an angler. So it happens to have a little lure that sits up top kind of like this, and this lure glows. It has that bioluminescence, and other animals are very much attracted to that light. They're like, oh, what is that? It's moving. I'm so enchanted by it, right? And as they get closer and closer and closer, well, bam, they get eaten right here in its mouth, right? So it's a really cool predator. Now, thing is, in the deep sea, as I mentioned, it makes animals look really big because we're getting really close in on them. Um, but believe it or not, this animal is quite small. It's probably about like this big or so. And as a matter of fact, if you ever watch any deep sea videos of any kind of um, submersible going down, you'll notice a lot of times that they have two laser beam dots that are, are, that are pointed towards the seafloor or any kind of animal that they might see. And those laser beams are 10 centimeters apart. And that's really helpful when in the deep, you don't have any kind of tree, you don't really have, there's no way that you can tell the size of things, right? It's really hard. So those 10 centimeter spacing is a great way for, for scientists, for those uh, pilots that drive the submersibles to really be able to get a good idea. Like here, right here. 
So this is a nice example. Um, now, you know, all of these animals are different kinds of predators, right? So we have some that kind of have that telltale large mouth. Maybe they have that lure. Um, and, you know, maybe some of them are just drifters waiting to slowly catch anything that comes by. And so, oh, here's a nice drifter right here, right? Here's a probably type of, not sure what this, oh, this is a sea cucumber. Um, so this is a different kind of predator, right? That really kind of eats a lot of that marine snow that we were talking about earlier. So it's pretty amazing. And we also have probably the size scale too, Dana was mentioning a little bit ago. Maybe it'll pop up in a little bit, but it's really cool. Ah, there's two red dots that were in that center. Oh, it goes by so quick. Awesome. All right. So we are seeing it. I don't think I'm seeing it. Oh, Dana's directing me. Oh, here they are. They're a lot different. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So that's about 10 centimeters. Sometimes they're green, sometimes they're red. Um, in this case, looks like on this video, it's kind of clearish in color. Good eye, Dana, right? But that's an example of what you can see um, and how you can scale different, different predators or different kinds of animals or, or your environment as a whole, right? How big is that mountain in front of me? Or how, is it a hill? Is it a mountain? Let's go on ahead and find out, right? So the scale is very helpful. So, um, and all these animals really kind of advantagely are very advantage in regards to what they're eating. So many times they will focus on that deep sea detritus. Sometimes they, you know, grow food maybe inside of them. Some of them actually depend on chemosynthesis. So much like how on land we are focused on photosynthesis to, to get us a lot of nutrients, um, a lot of deep sea animals will rely on chemosynthesis, chemicals coming from really hot places deep down called hydrothermal vents. So that's another way the animals can eat. So they can eat all sorts of different kinds of foods. Now, I, just did, I know we're running out of time, but I want to get to these last few questions. Um, it looks like, you know, we, uh, we got a comment of we thought that animals were extinct but are living in the deep sea. Um, and it looks like, you know, we thought at one point the goblin shark was extinct, but we've ha since then found out that goblin sharks are still around. So that's a really good question. Thank you for asking. And then what is the cutest deep sea animal? Ah, it definitely depends. Aaron's vote is with the Dumbo octopus. Ah, my vote's for the bobtail squid. But there are tons of really cool animals, right? And what's really great, once again, those big eyes, right? So to help them get whatever light that they can, but it also adds to the cuteness factor. So a double bonus. All right. And then also, um, someone noticed that they saw waves glowing. Was that bioluminescence? Absolutely. Oh, here's a cute Dumbo octopus. It is really adorable, right? So definitely one of the cutest. Now, that bioluminescence was actually caused by plankton at the very surface of the water. Um, and yes, that same blue glowing light definitely was a different kind of bioluminescence. Great questions, everyone. Thank you so very much for joining us today, asking really great questions and making some wonderful observations as well. It's definitely the last of our Aquarium Online Academy for this week, but not to fret. Next week, we will be back with more and exciting content. So thanks again for joining us and have a great day, everyone.